Thank you very much for the invitation. For this, this is a real honor to be here. And uh, I'm going to give you an overview of uh, the work that uh, my group in particular has been doing at the crossroads between two uh, technologies. One is semiconductor laser. Semiconductor laser are a technology uh, platform. Plas plasmonic is not quite a, a technology platform, but my belief is that with time it is going to become an actual te technology platform. So it's interesting to do some brainstorming and see what could be the overlap area, how one emerging technology like plasmonics can leverage on an, on an, on an, on an existing technology platform such as a semiconductor laser. We have been fortunate to have been collaborating in many of the topics of this, uh, of this talk here with the Hamamatsu Photonics. What's happening to the pointer here? Oh, I'll just use this. I don't need a pointer. Okay, and uh, these are the various uh, funding agencies. So I'm going to tell you about the main themes the main theme is that plasmonic is a powerful tool for the manipulation of EM fields from the visible to the actually far infrared. Semiconductor laser, on the other hand, we all know are, are, are the largest commercial pen penetration of all lasers. And recently, through quantum cascade laser, they have migrated very well into a region that diode laser could not easily do which is the mid-infrared region from 3 to roughly 20 micron. So the scene, I'm going to center my talk on the promise, the synergy of plasmonic and semiconductor laser, and in particular how we can engineer the near field and the far field of light sources, in particular laser. Some of the topics I'm going to cover is sub-wavelength frequency, beam shaping, I'm not going to say a lot on polarization control, and, uh, of course, the, one of the holy grails is to do beam steering in real uh, time. The whole point, and the last part is really a recent uh, approach that my group has uh, explored that we are quite excited uh, uh, about, and is the local control of the phase and amplitude of life using plasmonic meta materials, to be more correct, we should say as metasurfaces, because these are optically thin interfaces. And we think this can open a new area of work, which I would like to call surface optics. So this is a brief tutorial on what plasmon and surface plasmon is. I hope not too many of you are insulted by this, but one always has to make the assumption that certain concepts might be maybe not so uh, new to uh, uh, several people, and so the plasmon is a collective oscillation of a, uh, electrons in an actual metal driven by, by an electromagnetic field. This is a plasma frequency. Most interesting, when plasmon are confined to a metallic nanoparticle, they give rise to very intense local field, and we have a plasma resonance that depends on the size on the actual type of metal, and uh, so forth. Even more interesting, we can have uh, plasmons that are confined at the interface between a dielectric and an actual metal. They are called surface plasmon polariton, and uh, they can also localize light very near the interface. So this is, uh, the TM polarized uh, wave, so you have this traveling uh, charge density wave and the associated EM field and the dispersion which is omega versus k is like this. This is the light line you see and you see it's curved downwards here. So if you now try to couple light into such a wave there is a, at a certain frequency omega you see there is a momentum mismatch. So you have to compensate this momentum mismatch. You can do it by different ways. Typically you can actually use an actual grating. The whole point is waves, they become strongly bound to uh, the surface uh, and basically uh, with a, um, over a distance much smaller than the wavelengths, the closer you are to uh, this asymptote, which is real, the, uh, uh, the plasma frequency. 
So now uh, that I've introduced this course, I'm going to tell you some of the application of, in terms of nanoparticles and met metallic nanoparticle acts as an optical antenna. You know, the, and the plasma resonance depends on the shapes, the type of metal, and so forth. We can do these uh, nanoparticles by lithographic means. These are called the typically resonant optical antennas. Basically, light polarized along this direction gives rise to charge oscillations, and you have a resonance which is size uh, uh, dependent. When you are at resonance, you can create very intense fields right in the actual gap here. But, and by the way, your optical an antennas go back a long time. You know, if you look at the Lycurgus cap of many, many, many centuries ago, more than a, a millennium, in fact, is colors come from plasmonic resonance of embedded metallic nanoparticle. You might as well call them nano antennas that give the actual bright colors. And of course, a near field scanning optical microscopy is based on localized field over a sub-wavelength scale so you can do imaging and other interesting thing. So the real window into the nano world is antennas. We have explored the, how we can combine these uh, resonant uh, antennas with uh, semiconductor laser technology. In particular, these are off-the-shelf laser that you can buy for $50, $20, $30, dollars, even less actually now. Uh, this is in particular is a laser just schematically shown that emits a 0.8 micron. So if on the facet we actually bid a nano antenna that is resonant in wavelengths with the wavelengths of the actual laser, and we image with a near field scanning optical microscope, we see a very intense uh, spot here. And these intense spots, uh, uh, which are of the, of the order of, uh, this is near field energy that is concentrated over a scale of 20 nanometer in this case, gives rise to extremely high intensity, which you can use for interesting type of uh, application. We have done this also in the mid-infrared, you know, about uh, uh, 10 times uh, longer wavelengths, around 10 micron. In this case, the polarization in this way in the Quantum Cascade laser, and you can create a, a hot spots now at eight micron wavelengths. Again, this gap in this case is 80 nanometer. If you take a line scan, you can see beautiful the field in, uh, in uh, handsome and here. This could be an application for imaging. So I think actually there's a lot, and in fact there are companies right now that are working on using optical na nano, nano antennas combined with actual laser for heat assisted magnetic re, uh, recording, very high density data storage and so forth. We are interested in particular to address uh, sub wavelengths, uh, uh, chem bio imaging at wavelengths in the actual mid IR and so forth where we think one could push the frontier of uh, uh, infrared microscope well beyond what a Fourier transform infrared microscope can do. Basically do sub-wavelength imaging in the same wavelength range of F FDR microscope, which is actually could be exciting for biology and so forth. I'm now going to move. This is a lot, again, most of this work was done in collaboration with Hamamatsu for uh, tonics. And how we can do far field engineering of laser. The idea is basically the following. Okay, can we create a semiconductor laser with an arbitrary wavefront? So we can get, can we reduce dramatically the uh, uh, divergence? Can we control polarization? Uh, can we even do beam steering? Can we create special beam, vessel beam, vortex beam, whatever? Uh, it's, a, it's an exploratory area of research, but I hope I give you a glimpse that this is very exciting. The possibilities are really novel, what we can do. So the, the trick is to pattern plasmonic structure, metallic antennas, uh, aperture, and so forth, on the, on the facet of semiconductor laser, and also other optical components, by the way. And then through the local control of the amplitude and the phase, you engineer the uh, near field, but you're really interested actually in engineering the wavefront, the far field. And uh, the, uh, we... Uh, have developed quantum cascade lasers for many years. We use this as a platform to demonstrate these concepts. They are not limited to this wavelength range. You can certainly do them at telecom wavelengths, at other wavelengths. The mid IR is important because in this region, molecules uh, are, are absorb light. And it's fair to say that the advent of quantum cascade lasers opened up 
the field of mid-infrared uh, for uh, tonics by creating an enabling laser technology. And just a glimpse where we are with quantum cascade laser. Nowadays, we have about 20, 20 companies. It's gone up from 17 of this slide. Some are major player in photonics, such as Hamamatsu Photonics and uh, so forth. Uh, here on, uh, this is the band diagram, essentially, is just an energy staircase made of quantum wells, and by controlling the layer thickness and using the conventional, well-established technology platform of MOVPE-based growth of telecom uh, laser, this is very important, you can actually make quantum cascade laser using the same material combination going from roughly 3.5 micron up to 15 micron, and you can do actually pulse room temperature with high power, you can do CW with high power, particularly in the wavelength bands around uh, 4 to 5 micron, and uh, the other region is 8 to roughly 12 micron. And in fact, uh, this shows a package device we made with a company, Prana uh, Alitica, that gave, uh, this is not proprietary anymore, sorry. I mean, this is all published, by the way, okay, <laughs> uh, in various journals. And uh, it was work uh, funded by uh, a DARPA program called the EMIL program that called us to achieve record efficiency. So in this case, you see power levels of uh, uh, several watts of power, continuous wave at 4.6 uh, micron uh, uh, wavelengths with an efficiency of 12%. These numbers are now skyrocketed up to 25% in the group of Professor uh, uh, Zegi at Northwestern. So it's a maturing technology in the mid-IR, and there is, of course, the other region, the far infrared, where it's not yet a mature technology, where there's a lot of progress to make. So this is a, a beautiful laser we got from Hamamatsu, a buried heterostructure. If you look at the far field, it's actually well-behaved far field. The divergence is uh, large, but it's typical of semiconductor laser because of diffraction. There's no surprise in it. Okay, so we've asked the question, how we can, uh, using this platform, this state-of-the-art laser, the best that you can get, okay, and do plasmonics on it and see what we can do. For example, can we reduce the beam divergence? So this is the first uh, uh, attempt. It's very simple. Making a one-dimensional collimator. Can we squeeze the divergence in this direction here with this greater in semiconductor laser from about 60 degrees down to a few degrees to do this. Laterally, of course, whatever it is, is given by the width. So the idea essentially is to use like a, if you like, it's still an antenna-like concept. Uh, you create, uh, you put a silicon dioxide layer, you create a metallic grating, in particular, it's a second order grating. The spacing is very close to the actual wavelength here. You make a sub-wavelength aperture. The light, uh, as it emerges from the waveguide, scatters from the aperture. Part of it goes straight. Part of it travels as a plasmon, surface plasmon wave, it, and it scatters at this groove, at, at this uh, actually groove. And the argument is a high school physics argument. Basically, if you look at the phase differences between all these components, it's exactly 2 pi, because you have designed this uh, phase sheet to be 2 pi, Basically, so if you look at normal density, you see a strongly, you see a strongly interference a, a, a effect. The peak of the intensity goes up as n squared, the number of grooves, uh, and you have a strong narrowing. These are the simulations. And you can see also from the simulation, you can see the interference a, a effect of uh, the emerging waves. This is at a distance of a few uh, wavelengths. And uh, the experiment uh, bear indeed uh, mm, show that this works. Uh, devices with different number of grooves give different divergences, and we were able to go down from, you know, roughly 60 degrees divergence down to about few degrees, uh, few, few degrees divergence. The technique is a laboratory technique to fabricate these uh, structures, it uses focus ion beam, but we have explored quite successfully other technologies with the George Whiteside group using soft lithography tech, uh, and techniques and so forth. So it's also interesting to explore the fabrication technology in this particular uh, context. Now, of course, you, you want to make a real laser that's fully collimated. So the natural thing to think, if I make a sub-wavelength aperture here, 
Okay, then I get diffraction in all direction, and then I will have a propagating wavefront, roughly circular, so I want to essentially create a circular grating, but the physical principle is the same. Again, the far field is the coherent zoo, uh, perposition of the scattering the waves from the aperture and all these grooves here. They combine coherently in the near field. They give beam narrowing. And in fact, this is our collimator, again, made on this Samamatsu uh, laser here. And you can see you get a very nice spot in the actual far field with a small divergence. Now I have to tell you about the power output. In the previous device, we were getting about 50% of the actual uh, power of the original laser. Here, it's actually considerably less. If you go for the numbers, it's around you know, 20%. 20, uh, 20 and we have to, uh, 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 we have to uh, uh, address that. Let me tell you, this is not a loss due to the actual metal, because uh, at mid ir wavelengths, the plasmonic losses are very well managed. They're basically small. It's related to having a real uh, sub-wavelength aperture. I'm going to go back that into a moment. My students and postdoc have done some beautiful work in making more complex uh, collimators. You see here elliptical collimators. You know, the ellipsis has this beautiful property that it can collimate beams. So by designing elliptical collimators on the facet of laser, they've been able to do beam to uh, uh, launch a beam at a different angle, as you can see here, or even launch multiple beams, as you can see here. So this is quite a, 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 uh, exciting in terms of the things that you can do. We call this off-axis collimation. And in fact, you can have a multi-beam K uh, capability. But not only, if you have a broadband laser, QC laser can emit uh, a very broad gain spectrum, multiple wavelengths. So you can actually think that you can create beams of different wavelengths that are beamed in different directions of uh, space. So it's just uh, fascinating the variety of things that you can actually do. And, uh, but of course, we were uh, uh, interested in you know, increasing the output power uh, of, uh, and really say, can we get you know, a watt level laser? These are pulsed, highly collimated, Okay, because this could be potentially useful. So these are very recent uh, 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 data that we got with our colleagues at uh, Hamamatsu. And basically the idea is this. You want to widen the aperture. Okay, you, you want to get more throughput. This is about the size of the actual stack of quantum well vertically. You want to open this up. At the same time, you see the wave that emerges from the actual in order to increase the scattered efficiency by the grooves that really gives the collimation, you want to bound your surface stronger to, uh, you want to bound your electromagnetic wave more to the, to, the, to the surface so you increase the scattering efficiency, okay? What you want to do at the same time, you want to, inc this is an impedance matching problem, okay? You want to uh, improve the impedance matching between the waveguide mode and the surface plasmon polariton, okay? So it's actually, there is a circuit anal analogy here. And uh, you do this by putting these grooves, okay? If you put these grooves here, the grooves have a very interesting effect I'll describe in a natural uh, second, okay? Effectively, at the end, you know, you are reducing by a bit the reflectivity of uh, the facet. The slope efficiency goes up, the threshold, goes up also because you have reduced the reflectivity. This shows the final re, uh, result for this eight uh, micron uh, laser. Okay, this is the actual, the original laser about, you know, you're talking close to a watt power level. Okay, when you actually are putting the collimator on, everything finished and done, you actually, the important thing you get about the same order of magnitude, you actually, about the same value, you actually have an improvement and in, in, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of the actual power. So once you know you have this power level, you can do something useful. These are the experiments and the simulation of the actual far field. You can see you can get nice small di divergence with, uh, with high power level, consistent the simulation. See, what is the physical explanation actually? The physical explanation is basically here. Okay, what do the grooves do? 
the grooves effectively increase the skin depth. You see light, by, by putting this groove, these are sub-wavelength groove. This is like a metamaterial, basically. Energy piles up in these grooves, so you increase your actually skin depth, so the surface wave becomes more bound. The net effect, if you plot the new dispersion, the dispersion curve gets changed, and the asymptote, you can now move up and down the plasma frequency by a large value. And the new plasma frequency is actually a geometrical frequency that is the first order resonance of these plasmonic cavities here. So you can really engineer the electromagnetic uh, the surface plasmon as they propagate on the actual surface. And uh, you can improve the impedance matching to these uh, propagating waves. In the future, what we want to do is we want to combine a master oscillator power amplifier. This is work that my group uh, did recently. What you can ask yourself, what if I want to make a, a really, sing can I make a single longitudinal mode, single transverse mode, high power laser? If we just use a, with a distributed uh, uh, grating here and no amplifier, maybe we uh, can get 100 milliwatt uh, single mode, uh, transverse longitudinal, that's it. What if we want 10 times more a watt, several watt? We have combined with a tapered amplifier here. This is an adiabatic taper, so we can get a nice single mode and an output power of more, or more than, a, than an actual watt. So our goal is now is to make a very highly collimated beam by combining plasmonic with a master oscillator power uh, amplifier. I now want to, uh, I told you about like using these metamaterial concepts, you can actually engineer the surface wave, the dispersion curve of polaritons on a surface, okay? So if we move further and we talk about quantum cascade laser at terahertz frequency, this means really long wavelengths, you know, 60 to 300 micro. The waveguide is used in that, in that case for a variety of reasons that give you the highest operating temperature and uh, other advantages is a so-called double metal waveguide where you squeeze the active region, as you can see here, you squeeze it between two metal uh, regions. The problem is now this becomes a sub-wavelength aperture, and when you make a sub-wavelength aperture, of course you have a huge diffraction. Okay, so we wanted to explore these metamaterial, plasmonic metamaterial concept uh, applied to try to solve the divergence problem of these lasers, and incidentally, you know, you, um, it is a very large, uh, it is a very large, di it is a very large divergence. If you don't put uh, something on the facet, the divergence is basically close to 180 degrees in a vertical direction because you have a sub-wavelength aperture. The first attempt, by the way, at these frequencies, these are terahertz, the semiconductors, gallium assay, are metallic. So we don't have to put any actual metal on top. We just sculpt the facet under the facet we just sculpt it, make this aperture. This is a second order grating. And you can see, you get a collimation effect. This is now the divergence, vertical divergence. But there is a lot of energy wasted in the actual tails. Why is that physically? Because at even longer wavelength, the wave is extended a lot in space. It doesn't feel the grooves too much. So the scattering efficiency is not very, is not very, very large. So we have, again, to squeeze these uh, waves. I want to say an historical thing here, you know, surface plasmon were discovered, actually, by the great uh, physicist of uh, the atomic theory, Arnold Sommerfeld. Okay, this was the time where Marconi and actual others had made the first uh, experiment, and uh, uh, Sommerfeld had speculated, and of course, the reason is, why can, why can you get a signal, if you have a transmitter here, why can you get a signal here because of the curvature of the actual Earth? How can the thing? So Sommerfeld was thinking, he didn't know about the ionosphere. Maybe the surface acts like a conductor for, and, and the waves can ride the bed conductor, which, which is the Earth. Very interesting thing. So he published the first theory of uh, surface uh, plasmons are uh, applied to the Earth. And he found, of course, it was radio frequency, they are very weakly bound. My modern standards, 
these are not surface plasma, but the mathematics, you know, he was a great mathematician besides a great physicist, was all worked out at the beginning of the actual last century. It was forgotten, put it on the shelf. It's now coming back in a modern constant. So here we have a similar problem, not as bad, of course, because terahertz lasers are not radio frequencies, that these surface waves are weakly bound. So if we put just a simple grating, you see that we cannot really confine a lot uh, the energy to the surface, so we cannot get this collimation effect. So the idea is now to engineer the surface, and we did this, uh, published it uh, two years ago, is if we engineer the surface as a combination of a second order grating, which has a function of scatter uh, the, uh, the propagating waves into the far field, okay, as a metamaterial here, Essentially, we are modifying the dispersion in a, in a natural way that the, the electromagnetic fields become much more strongly bound to the surface. They feel the grooves much more strongly. The scattering efficiency is larger. The collimator effect is larger. Again, I want to point out there is no metal here. The metal is a semiconductor surface beneath the laser ridge. And it works. It actually works quite uh, beautifully, okay? You can increase uh, the confinement by uh, more than an order of, uh, of uh, magnitude, okay? Basically, the wave, if you don't do this trick, extends up to, you know, hundreds of micron out. But if we use this trick of engineering the surface, like making it into a metamaterial, you can squeeze the electromagnetic wave at the surface, and it's actually quite... Uh, the effect is quite large. You get a large increase in the surface plasmon uh, confinement. These are the results. You see, this is this facet as a metamaterial, which at the same time as a second order grating, which scatters, creates, uh, um, scatters the, the surface wave in energy into the far field. These are the results of the experiment. These are as a result of the simulation. So we... Uh, have dramatically improved the uh, divergence. In fact, the properties of these waves are interesting. Uh, you have these deep grooves here. The waves propagate uh, laterally, so you don't have, you of course have also very small divergence parallel, so you have nice spots. And the actually, you have increased the coupling power in the far field, and you get significantly better optical, uh, optical power output at these, uh, at, these, uh, at these data show. So again, I'm showing you this as a, rather than view it, you know, well, this is a device we are going to use for something, is I want to show you that, again, the combination of plasmonics with uh, an established platform, semiconductor laser, can lead to an interesting spectrum of possibilities, some of which I'm certain will lead to very useful type of application. Now I want to move in the last uh, sort of, you know, uh, eight minutes or so to the most recent uh, work that my group has uh, been doing, which doing a control of uh, light with phase discontinuities using meta-interfacing. The idea is, uh, the, is the following. Take a st structure like this. This is a so-called meta-interface, and it has a sub-wavelength uh, thickness. It's optically thin. It's made of antennas. Now, each antenna scatters the uh, light, is an optical resonator, scatters the light with a certain amplitude and with a certain phase. So if you have a wavefront that is, uh, that is incident, if you manipulate uh, appropriately the phases and the amplitudes, okay, in particular the phase is absolutely a crucial point, okay, you can literally design the wavefront of the actual scattered uh, the, the transmitted and the reflected waves. And we have found some very interesting uh, uh, an, 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 an anomalous reflection and uh, refraction, and uh, which has led us to find a powerful generalization of the laws of reflection and uh, refraction. If you're interested, Physics Today wrote a cover story, and this article is really beautifully listened. It's a beautiful commentary article by one of the Physics Today article which explains things in the simplest uh, possible way. So an antenna is a bar like this. 
uh, if you are near resonance, you will scatter with a certain amplitude. There is a phase response. The key thing, if you want to control, you see the phase, uh, in the wavefront, you want to have a phase control from zero to, uh, 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 to pi. That is important. I'm going to tell you now how these ideas of the, gen the generalized Snell law and reflection law come about. Conceptually, it's very simple. Come at normal incident to, uh, to an actual interface. There is no, no antenna on there. Light goes uh, 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 straight, completely simple and trivial. Now, suppose you engineer the surface so that you put these optical antennas so that they now scatter light with a certain phase shift between the scattered light and the incident light. And you can design the phase response. One antenna will have a certain phase shift than the other. What is obviously the phase shift controls the wavefront. You can actually tilt the wavefront. And if you come in with an actual plane wave, and you can show if you engineer the phase response to be linear with distance, constant phase gradient, you transform a plane wave into a plane wave, and now we call this an anomalous refraction. If you now want to be a bit more general, you can ask yourself if I have a phased surface of antenna designed with a constant phase gradient and equal scattering amplitude for each antenna, you get a beautiful generalization of the, of the actual Snell law. You see, this is, with the, is, this is, this, this is equal zero, just the ordinary Snell law. Refractive index of this medium, refractive index of this medium, incident angle, refraction angle. If you have a phase uh, variation here, you can apply Fermat's principle, find the path of stationary phase, and this is a new law of reflection. You see, it depends on the phase grading. So you can have very interesting, and the same now for reflection. You can, the angles of reflection and refraction will not be equal anymore. You can get new critical angles. It's actually very, and I need to wrap up very soon. I can see the clock here. This is the antenna that my group designed, the arrays of antennas. And here I have to go actually pretty fast, okay? This is the unit. Again, these are sub-wavelength space elements, su deep sub-wavelength thickness. If you like, this is a meta-surface. Meta this is not a grating, okay? And uh, you can design, you, by varying the shape of these V antennas, you can design all the elements to have the same scattering amplitude, but different phase shift. In particular, this is designed that we want to see the these uh, anomalously reflected and refracted beam in cross-polarization. For the time being, it's a bit of a technical detail, but I, but I need to actually mention it. And uh, so these are the simulations. You see, you come in at normal incidence to an interface of air and silicon. The wavefront gets, gets tilted. And you, in fact, you can reconstruct it by generalizing just Eugen's principle, which is physically very nice. The experiment is a most simple experiment. You take a normal beam of light, you put a metasurface, you expect an ordinary refracted beam, but you expect this anomalous refraction. These are the data. This is done in the mid-infrared. You see this is the, the beam that goes directly. The angle, the refraction angle is zero, but you see the anomalous beam that in this case carries away about 30% of the incident uh, intensity and it follows precisely the new law of uh, refraction. We did, uh, uh, I want to basically stop here, but we did a detailed study of uh, refraction as a function of incident angle. This is the regularly refracted beam. This is the anomalous refracted beam. You can get anomalous re, uh, re refraction. You get two angles for critical, uh, two critical angles as I said before, and in reflection, now the two angles are no more equal for the anomalous reflection, and you can even get negative reflection, the light coming back to you in this direction. And uh, I want to uh, conclude by saying this is a, a very nice uh, uh, initial demonstration, but there's a lot that we can do. Basically, we have optically thin designer interface that can give us complete control 
of the scattered light reflected transmitted beam and we can extend the range of transformation optics beyond metamaterials, conventional metamaterial. If you like, you know, in the language of microwaves, we can say we are creating reflect arrays and transmit uh, uh, arrays at optical wavelengths, which is a wide open area. We can make a new class of flat, compact, broadband components, lens polarized. A beautiful uh, example demonstrated by my group is if you engineer these antennas in a circle like this with sector, each sector produces a different phase shift. Uh, they have been able to create a nice vertex beam which carries orbital angular momentum. And you interfere that with the natural Gaussian beam, which has a basic a spherical wave front, you get a spiral. Okay? If you interfere the vertex beam with a tilted plane wave, you can see you get a nice dislocation line. So there is a tremendous opportunities by using local phase control of light, in my opinion, in a novel class of devices for the future. Just a large part of this work, not the last one, was reviewed recently in January 1st of laser and photonic review. It's now it's time to give credit to the people that have done all, the, all uh, this work. And my group, I want to mention in particular the critical role of Zeno Gerbuch, a visiting uh, scientist, uh, Nan Fang Yu and the others that have contributed tremendously to this uh, work. Uh, external collaborators, the group of uh, Hamamatsu, which I mentioned, and uh, the group of uh, University of Leeds uh, for the terahertz uh, laser, former postdoc, Professor Wang, now at Nanyang Technical University, and also Marlon Scully from the Institute of Quantum Study and Department of Physics at Texas A&M. Thank you for your attention.